So uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Yanu. I'll be a host for today's webinar. I work with the one to trust in vital. We are hosting this webinar after the COVID because since the COVID, we have been not getting a lot of ID submissions and the other data contributions for the researchers here. It's mostly because we cannot really go out for the monitors, I assume. Or the same with the turtles and the whale sharks. But now we are moving past the COVID and the Maldives is slowly opening up. So hopefully we can build the community stronger than before and start the research with the whale shark research, the Manta, the Olive Ridley project, and the Maldives National, Maldives Marine Research Institute. So today for the meeting, first people to talk will be MMRP. MMRP will be talking from 7.10, to 730. And then after MMRP, there will be the Well Shark Research Program from 730 to 750. And then after that, the Olive Ridley Project will talk. They will be talking from 750 to 810. And then last but not least, it will the Maldives Marine Research Institute from 8.10 to 8.30, and after that, we'll open for the questions for all. So for MMRP, MMRP is an NGO working towards the conservation and the well-being of the manjas. Jess from Ra will be representing MMRP and she will be talking about the research they're doing and how we all can in get involved as the citizens. And for the Maldives Well Shark Research Program, they are the main researchers of the well sharks in Maldives. They're also an NG an NGO and work for non-profit. They focus on collecting the baseline data on the whale sharks of Maldives, mainly on the South Mary, South Area Marine Protected Area, SAMPA, and the Olive Ridley Project, uh, ORP, is about protecting the sea turtles and their habitat in the Indian Ocean. They have been rehabilitated in the turtles, which we find floating around in the sea. And they'll be talking about the photo ID, the code of conduct, sea turtle hatchling experience, and about the research center. This will be done by Emily, Dr. Claire, and Isha. And after the MM, from MMRP, Hannah will be telling us about the coral database, the national protocols for marine Sorry, and, and she'll introduce the latest marine protocol. And while we are doing this webinar, you can always ask questions in the Q&A on the Zoom, and you can also comment on the Facebook Live. We'll be sharing this on Facebook Live. And when you ask the questions, can you please write whoever this is aimed for, like, if you're asking the Manta Trust a question, can you write Manta Trust before you write the question so we'll know who will be answering? And then we'll be checking the questions as we go. So I'll hand over to Jess from Manta Trust so that she can tell us more about the Mantas and the research. So, Jess. Okay, thank you, Yanni. Thank you for the introduction. And hello to everyone watching. Um, it's very nice of you to join us this evening and learn more about each of the projects that we have presenting. 
So I am here working with the Moldivia Manta Ray project, and we're going to go through a bit of the information of the research that we've been uh, working on. As a charity, we are um, working around the globe, as well as in the Maldives, on three fundamental pillars. Our three aims to go um, for our research is the research, the education, and also the collaboration. So all of this that we're working towards is to create a sustainable future for our ocean giants, but as well as their relatives as well. So in the Maldives, we are actually where it all started back in 2005. So the Maldivian Manta Ray project, which you'll hear um, a few times, maybe a few of you followers on social media already. If you don't, then the handles are shown on the screen now. So you can have um, a browse through our Instagram, Facebook, and keep up to date with the work following this webinar. But the, after the MMRP was formed, the Manta Trust was actually um, then created in 2011. So currently we have project bases or partnerships with six different atolls within the Maldives. So all of those are highlighted in the app. Prior to COVID, we were also in uh, Ari and North Mali Atoll, and hopefully we'll be bringing project managers back in the near future as well. So here's a bit about our team. Uh, you might recognize a few of the faces there if you know about our project already. In Ra, which is where I'm based right now, um, I'm, we're actually the newest project that began in 2019, but our population of mantas is ever growing each year. So the longer that we stay here and the more that we research this area, the more we're finding out about which individuals are frequenting the area. And we're finding that a lot of the mantas are also similarly seen in Bar. So you can see in team Team Bar, they have uh, the longest running project from 2007 onwards, and they have 2,097 individuals that have been seen there to date. They have a member, four members of the team, and they also currently have two interns with them as well to help them in the busy season uh, of the Southwest monsoon. Our other project over on the east is Laviani Atoll, and that's in partnership with Pro Divers at Huravali. And that's Eileen, and um, they also are learning more and more about the population of mantas within that area and how those mantas might move between different atolls. The project's been there since 2017. So again, the longer we stay and the more we get information from all of you guys as well, the more we learn about these different areas. Lamu Atoll is right down south. We've got two members of our team there, and um, they actually have the smallest population of mantas but they're resident to that area. So they are rarely, if ever seen anywhere else in the Maldives. Something in Lamu keeps them there for the entire time. So they're also very lucky. So our research is pretty simple and that's how, what we're gonna go through in a bit about how you guys can help us as well. And that is photographic ID. So all you need is a camera, whether that's a GoPro or any kind of underwater camera, and the mantis belly pattern is completely unique to those individuals. They're born with the same pattern and it hardly changes throughout their life. So it's a great way for us to identify them in our database. So we've been collecting data of photographs since 1987. And uh, that's actually a lot of the data has come from citizen scientists as well as researchers. So what we do with the photos is once we've got them in our hands, we compare them against our database. So we have a lot of mantas to search through, but I'm gonna give you all a chance to try. So have a look at the five images there and the bigger picture, and then have a guess at which one it matches with. Kind of like a spot the difference. We're gonna launch a poll now so that you can see. And hopefully you can pick. <laughs> All right, it's up. So give an answer. <laughs> You're all very speedy at answering. Yeah, a few more seconds. I think most of you are getting it right. So it is pretty easy. Um, it is uh, on some mantas a little bit more difficult when the spots are merged together. But let's end the poll now and see what we got, what answer we got. I think everyone was right in saying that it's number five. So this manta has a code name, MVMA 
and a four digit code. The four digit code is the unique number in the database. MV standing for Maldives, MA for Mobula Alfredi, and then we like each manta to have a given name, so someone kindly named this manta Mai. So that's our research um, technique, and with that photographic IDs, we now have the largest recorded population of mantas in the entire world. So the photo in the corner is the 5,000th manta to be added to the database. There's a huge milestone for us, but we've already surpassed that and we have 5,092 individuals currently in our database. The other amazing thing about Maldives is the large aggregations of mantas that can form during um, certain seasons, particularly when there's high levels of plankton available. So the largest aggregation is in Hanning Faro Bay, which a lot of you have probably heard of. All mantas, along with other ray species, were all added to the protected species list in 2014 which is great for this country. It means that we can keep this high number of them. We can use them for tourism and we can use them as a study pilot to aid other um, management protocols in other countries where fisheries take place. There's a gill plate trade where many people are targeting manta rays just for the gills, same like the shark fin trade. So this is something we're working towards. They don't reach maturity until they're around 15 years old, so they just don't withstand any fishery pressures. So here's a few of our most interesting mantas. We have the most sighted manta in the Maldives, Mike. He is the code name 1212, and he's been recorded 377 times so far since his first photo taken in 2008. Then we have our largest aggregation of mantas, which is 247 manta rays in Hanifari Bay back in 2016. So whoever was there on that day, you're extremely lucky. I think my maximum is 100, maybe 110. <laughs> and then we have our miraculous mantas. So mantas are subject to injuries from boat strikes, shark attacks, and, and um, other anthropogenic threats. And this manta Babaganoush had a really nasty strike from a boat back in 2018. But luckily, when we saw this manta again a year later, she had print or he had actually completely healed almost back to normal. So they have an amazing healing ability. We just like to promote sustainable tourism where we can do what we can to minimize the impacts that we're causing to them. So all of the data that we collect from all of you and anyone else, as well as ourselves, we form into annual reports. So if you're working in any of the atolls that we've mentioned that where we're based, so whether that's Male, Ra, Ba, Lamu, Laviani, or Ari Atoll, we actually can, um, we put all of the data into these annual reports. You can find them on our website in the resources page. And this will give you a lot more in-depth detail about the atoll you're working in and the mantas that you find there. So go and have a look if you're interested. Feel free to um, share them with guests as well if you have any particularly interested people. The other thing we work on is education. So this is Mudu Matarusa. It started in 2015 and we have currently conducted the program at seven schools across four atolls. So part of the program is to engage students in snorkeling on the local islands, teach them about the marine life, teach them about plastic pollution and engage them in island cleanups and a lot of different activities. A similar program is also run in Hello Halu uh, in Lamu Atoll, and they have also had great success with running it at five different schools and many participants. A bit about our research that we've been working on. So this is a study conducted by Amy Nicholson, and it was the first study to really look at in detail at hitchhiker species within manta and um, oceanic and reef manta rays. So we have, they locate, found that the golden trevally, pilot fish, and red snapper were frequently seen with mantas. They also found that heavily pregnant mantas, as well as those that were found cleaning, were more likely to have a shark sucker remora um, following them around. And there was also, the, for the first time, a seasonal variation recorded where they found that the northeast monsoon was also uh, had a higher um, amount of shark sucker remoras following the mantas and swimming along with them. 
Another research article that has just been published is the visitation of mantis between different sites. So this was a study back in 2017 to 2010. So 2007 to 2010. And this was uh, tagging 13 different mantis. And where you can see the blue dots, that's where the receivers were positioned. And what they found is that the mantis actually frequent different sites, but they use them as a network. So that's where it becomes quite important that environmental variations also dictate where the mantis are gonna be seen. So if one site has heavy protection, for example, Hany Ferry Bay, they might not be there every single day, so they don't withstand that high level of protection, but they utilize other sites within the area, the same individuals being seen. So our aim in the future is to try and uh, work with the government to expand marine protected areas to encompass more of the sites, uh, not just one single area. All our other peer reviewed articles can be found on our website, again on the resources link. So please uh, feel free to go and have a read, check them out and learn a lot more about the work that we're working on, but also all of the data that you guys might contribute to, it goes towards these kind of studies as well. We also collaborate with master's students. So if any of you are currently students yourselves or if you're gonna be studying in the future, there's always an opportunity to collaborate with the Mantis Trust. And again, using the data that we uh, collect as a, ourselves and as well as everyone else, it can go towards studies like this. So ones that have recently been um, released is one looking at all of the Maldives, comparing the site use between juveniles and adult mantis. It's found that a lot of juveniles are mostly, and if not only seen in lagoons, if they're in the younger years of their life, particularly if they've just been born, where we call them young of year. And then another study is looking at sublethal injuries of manta rays and how um, they are most, most commonly impacted. So we found that adults are the ones that sustain most injuries, most likely because they've been around the longest, they've been uh, able to get more injuries. And then also, but juveniles, they were the ones that sustained injuries more quickly as well. We also found that the mantas within the central atolls of the Maldives were the ones with more injury events than those in the northern and southern regions. Again, all the master's thesis reports are on the website. So feel free to go and have a look, have a read at what people have been working on and see what your data is actually going towards. Some of the research that we're currently uh, still working on, we collect this data each year and um, a lot of the projects are each contributing towards this, this uh, data collection is the stereo videography. So we have got calibrated cameras that can take the exact size measurement of manta rays. So the largest recorded mantis so far was 4.2 meters, which is huge, but as if you've swam with them before, you'll know they're completely beautiful and gentle. And the smallest manta was actually found in Marmanigal, which is where I work. And it was a young of year manta, and um, he was actually born in 2019. So we've, we've measured quite a few mantas within this area and they all seem pretty small compared to the other regions where we're taking uh, measurements. So one of the studies is to see how fast they grow when, when they're juveniles and how quickly they get to full, full size. The contactless ultrasound is another study. It doesn't require any contact with the animal. It, the salt water acts as the medium, so there's no need to get um, further than 10 centimeters close to them. They are looking for whether the womb has been developed. So by scanning the manta, and if the womb is present, we can actually dictate if they're mature or not. So currently the only way to tell if a female is a mature adult is based on the dorsal scarring on the left side of her fin. With the ultrasound, we'll be able to find out if they reach maturity at a younger age than we currently realize. And the other thing is we'll be able to detect pregnancies before they're visible. So right now we can only do, uh, record a pregnancy when they're in their third trimester. The Eyes on the Reef is another exciting project. They've just launched a year long study in Lamu where this camera system will be deployed for each every single day of the year and it will take a photo every minute between sunrise and sunset. So for that entire year, we'll be able to look at the visitation rates of mantas at that one cleaning station. 
and then compare it against the environmental variables, sea temperature, wind conditions, and see um, whether that impacts their visitation to cleaning areas. We also leave remote underwater videos down so we can record what the mantas are up to whilst we're not there swimming with them. Some upcoming research that's in the works from a, a few of our project managers is a plankton study. So Hannah Maloney is going to be recording whether the zooplankton abundance in Hanifaro Bay dictates what kind of feeding strategy the mantas are using, as well as the species of plankton that are being observed. And she will be taking this data over the full moon and the new moon and seeing, and also before and after it, just to see what changes in the mantis behavior and whether the plankton has anything to do with that. The nursery assessment is a study by myself uh, where we're gonna be comparing all of the data we've got of all the juvenile mantas in Marmanigal area in Bra. And this is hopefully going to assess whether Marmanigal fits the criteria of an Elasmobranch nursery site. So if it does, it would be the first official nursery site recorded in the Maldives. And um, we, we know that there are other areas, we just don't have enough data on them to show that they, they could be. So if you know or you work in an area where there's juvenile mantas, please help to contribute data from those places. Reproductive hormones is a study by Beth Faulkner. She, we have found uh, in other studies that fish, the mucus on fish, is the same level hormone level concentrations as that of the blood. So it's quite invasive to take blood samples. Therefore, by taking the mucus, it's much less invasive. And we can start to learn about the hormone level concentrations of mantas and whether that fluctuates with the breeding season. And if there's more hormones, uh, we can dictate when the breeding season would be. And uh, it would also help to help us find out at what age they reach maturity as well. A few other projects, we're gonna look at boat traffic by using drones. So we'll be recording videos of um, where, how the boats are around the mantis and how the mantis react in response to those speeds, whether we need to implement uh, measures such as speed restrictions or distance of approach. We also will be conducting fishermen interviews in Lamu later this year, and we would like to require anyone working there to participate and help with that data collection. The fishery, the interviews will just be um, finding out what the fishermen know about mantas and their threats. And the economic value of mantas was recorded in 2010, so it's quite a while ago now, and it was found that people spend each year about $8.1 million overall on Maldives mantis tourism. So with that value, obviously now they've become more and more popular. So we're doing a reassessment of this study and that's where you guys might be able to help us out as well. It's a 10 minute survey and we will send it around there when it's ready, so in a couple of months. And it's just a 10 minute survey, so you can just fill it in if you were working in the Maldives back in 2019 as 2020 was kind of a half year. So we're gonna focus on the value of the mantas up to 2019. So a bit about our citizen science, this uh, pie graphs here show that the MMRP researchers collect a majority of the data in these atolls, but we still rely heavily on citizen science. So like in Ra, you can see the dark blue, which is citizen science, is like almost halfway, and that shows how much we rely on submission data from other people. When we look at the other atolls, majority, more than half of the data that we collect or that we have in our database has come from outside researchers. So it's completely vital that um, we get these submissions and we get the help from you guys, from your guests, from yourselves, whoever it is, because it actually goes a long way within our research and what we can learn about the manta population. When we look at the Maldives as a whole, most of our data has come from outside resources. So rather than the Maldives researchers in, in um, position. So the dark blue in the graph shows all of the atolls where citizen science has been uh, contributing to our research. So you can see that we really do need your help and that it goes a long way by having you aiding our research and contributing to our data. Um, it's not just, we're just one person or a small team in one island. 
and um, everyone that can help, it does go a long way. Formula's not on here because there's actually only been one reef manta recorded in formula, but there is a separate database for oceanic mantas which frequent the area during the Northeast monsoon months. So they're also uh, heavily reliant on submission scientists from there as well. So how can you help? All you have to do is photograph the underside of a mantis belly. So each mantis belly is like a fingerprint, like we said. So whether you're diving, snorkeling, um, free diving, you can actually just record a video and or screenshot that belly photo when you get back to your place of work. And the most important area is the area between the gills. So this area uh, and the lower region would be what we look for the most. To submit your photographs, you just need to go on the internet, type in ID the manta and search for the top link, it should always be the top link, ID the Manta database. And once you've got that link, it will take you through to our page where you can put in your first submission for IDing the Mantas. And you just follow the step-by-step -step survey uh, entry that it shows up, you submit your images, and then we will reply with which Mantas you have seen and a little bit of information about those Mantas. So here's a picture of the submission spreadsheet how you can choose a file and the key things that you need to record would be the date the site name and the atoll that you located them in of course with the photos as well if you work in one of the atolls where we have a project manager working so the six atolls we mentioned we can actually set you up with a dropbox account so this is the easiest way and the quickest way for us to get feedback to you which you can also share with your guests which mantis were seen on different days so we'll link you to the Dropbox folder like this one. We will then inside the Dropbox add an ID folder as well as a survey spreadsheet. The survey spreadsheet is only important if you become a regular submitter. The most important thing for us is the Manta photo IDs. That's the key thing. You just need to create a folder within there, which has the date, it has the site name, the time that you encountered the Mantas or that you're in the water, your name and then the place where you're working as well. And then what you can do is just put the photos inside. You don't have to label them Manta 1 to 4, but it does always help if you want to do that. Um, you can just leave them as unedited. And then we will rename them with the code name of the Mantas like this. And then what we'll do is we'll follow up with a email and we'll give you the information about which mantas you saw. And if it's a new manta to our database, we will give you the opportunity to name that manta as well. So that's a great incentive for sending us mantas, getting to choose a name for them. You will receive a manta identification report. You just have to give us three name choices. We do have more than 5,000 mantas in our database. So you've got to be a bit creative with the name and um, we will see which name is available. And then we'll check with you that you're happy and that will officially be the Manta's name for the rest of uh, time. So it'll be added to our database as Jesse or Hainsey or whatever you choose. We also have our Swim with Manta's resources that we want to um, offer for you all to download, completely free. So you just sign on to www.swimwithmantas.org. It's got a 10 step guide with how to swim with Manta's. It comes in 10 different languages, so you can print it out you can have them on the boat, you can share them, let guests read them or go through them yourself during the briefing. It just goes through what stages you should do with swimming with mantas, what distance you should stay from them, what you shouldn't do, for example, touching mantas. And there's also a short educational film in a couple of languages, which you can show them before you head out on the boat or have it on replay in your dive center or on the TVs around the resort. We also, just before I sign off, I'm gonna promote World Manta Day. So it's coming up on the 17th of September. This is uh, the second year that World Manta Day is running. So we're also gonna be sending out a resort pack. It doesn't have to be for resorts, can be for uh, any liveaboard local island as well. And it will have inside presentations, games, uh, posters for you to print. So you can keep using them and have the resources as you wish. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you have lots of questions that my colleagues behind the screens have been answering. And I'm now going to hand back over to Yanu, who will introduce the next presentation.
Thank you just so much for all the information. So I hope you all learn more about the mantras and the mantra research, the mantra trust do at the Maldives. And then you can always go to the Monte Trust website resources where you can get how to swim with the mantras, all the articles which are published. And then we hope that you are excited for the world mantra days and, and then you will be submitting the photo data and the ideas to the MMRP. Now I'll ask Buzz from the Maldives Well Shark Research Program to tell us more about the well sharks in the Maldives. So Buzz. Hello, Yanu. Yeah, hey. Let me just share. So for the people who have questions in the Q&A, we'll be answering them in the Q&A as text, or we'll leave some for the end of the webinar that we can answer on live. Some of them are really interesting, so we'll keep some of them to talk about and have a little discussion. So yeah, if Bus is ready, we can start with the well shot. Okay. Um, does everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Nice to meet you all. Thank you everyone for coming uh, for the presentation. So nice. Uh, my name is Basit and I'm from the Maldives Well Shark Research Program. So uh, we got a little bit of introduction about the program. We got established in the Maldives in 2008 and we've been collecting data mainly in South Ari Atoll where the whale sharks are mostly frequenting in the Maldives. So we've been collecting data for about 10 to 12 years now uh, in South Ari. And um, currently and recently we have also expanded to do more data collection from other atolls of the Maldives as seasonal aggregations of whale sharks are uh, uh, becoming more frequent in atolls like Pytol, Pytol, and also Formula. Sorry. So our main research objectives is understanding uh, why the world sharks are here, and uh, to do that, we are able we are trying to collect uh, data about the individuals, gender distributions. Also trying to understand the whale shark relationships between humans, also how they're interacting and how we are interacting with the whale sharks. So in a level of local community, resorts, store operators and other stakeholders. So general idea of tourism around the area as well as it is growing in the area. So a little introduction about whale sharks. So they are elasbrank, uh, cartilaginous elasbrank fish. They are uh, just like manta rays, they feed on plankton and they are the biggest fish in the sea. So they can grow up to 18 meters, 18.8 meters, the largest recorded one. And uh, they are projected to be living 30 years of age. And they're also deep diving creatures, uh, diving up to 1,923 meters, deepest recorded. And another thing is, I'm sure everyone knows that they are also endangered species. So whale sharks uh, got listed as endangered in the IUCN red list in 2016 um, due to a huge population decline in the last 10 years. So whale shark population has declined around 75%, um, about uh, 60% in the Indo-Pacific and about 35% in the Atlantic Ocean. Another thing that you would notice is that the whale shark is completely covered in spots. And this is how we identify the individual. So every individual has a unique spot pattern all over their body, but we have a specific area that we target to take pictures to identify them. So, uh, well, sharks are very easily identifiable by taking lateral ID photos just behind their gills. 
and above the pectoral fins. So if you go in line with the shark in the same depth and take a picture, uh, just like the ones here in the pictures, um, it's very easy to identify them. And then uh, to identify the sex of the whale shark, you have to take a picture underneath the whale shark between the pelvic fins. So <clears throat> whether the presence of claspers or whether it doesn't have claspers, we can identify if it's a male or a female. Also, injury photos is also very important. So we, are, we recently released uh, several papers about our injury impact of the whale shark. And this is due to a uh, lot of contributions from lots of citizen scientists sending us data about the injuries that the whale sharks uh, has. So if you do see any whale sharks, try and get these pictures. And then we also start collecting top ID pictures. And this is due to recent uh, emerge in whale sharks uh, data collection in India and Pakistan. So our neighbors, they also uh, have a whale shark aggregation, but since there is no tourism, uh, it's only fishermen who get the photo IDs. So to compare with the IDs, with which they have our top IDs, we also start collecting top ID pictures. So <clears throat> we have a uh, uh, photo ID identification software called the I3S. It's very simple. Uh, uh, software that anyone can use. So anyone interested in submitting pictures, we can help you and you can send us pictures through any of our online platforms. But if you are interested in identifying the whale sharks yourself and sending us the data, we can help you get signed up to the Big Fish Network. So Big Fish Network started out in 2013 and we uh, it has grown since then, and we have about 140 contributors in the Big Fish Network. So if anyone is interested in joining and submitting data to us, please feel free to contact us after the presentation. And we'll, we can send you all the materials that you need to use our I3S and the Big Fish Network. So well shots are... Uh, as you know, they, they are present in the Maldives, but most of you know them to be seen in South Ari Atoll. So South Ari Atoll is the biggest aggregation of whale shark in the Maldives. And it is a very unique aggregation comparing it to the rest of the world as well. It is a year round aggregation, which means there is whale sharks in South Ari uh, Atoll all year round. So from January to December, every month of the year, you have a chance of seeing them in the, in the area. So they're mostly hanging around in the outside reef of the South Ari in the Southern area. So the South Ari Marine Protected Area. And then we have other seasonal aggregations as well. So Pai Toll and Thai Toll, we have a similar demographic of individuals, just like South Ari, juvenile male whale sharks. And uh, they, we've also started recording a lot of movements from these atolls. And this is obviously thanks to contributors as our, uh, with our small team, we are not present in these atolls. So uh, again, thank you again for anyone who submits pictures from these areas. And another uh, new interesting area that we started to take interest in is Formula Island. So. Formula has a population of whale shark that is more transient than the rest of the Maldives, where the whale sharks are a lot bigger and they are also mainly female whale sharks. So another interesting area and completely different population from the rest of the Maldives as well. So our main focus in studying the whale sharks is in South Ari Marine Protected Area. So it was declared in 2009, and um, it is uh, one of the biggest marine protected areas in the Maldives. It stretches all the way from Digura Island, all the way around the outside reef up to Rangali. So it has a one kilometer boundary from the reef fringe, and uh, it encompasses the most of the southwestern reefs of uh, the atoll.
So uh, one of the biggest questions that we still haven't determined completely is that why the world sharks are in solitary. Uh, uh, most uh, recent uh, uh, thoughts are that, that the whale sharks are using this area as a secondary nursery. So a lot of the individuals that are new to the area that come to the area are juvenile male whale sharks, and then they seem to stay around the area for several years before they move on. So they are using this area as a staging ground um, for food and shelter. So we think that do, they do most of that feeding down at the depths and then they're coming up to the surface to thermoregulate. So when we do see a whale shark in South Ari, we are mostly seeing them uh, just cruising along the surface, just following the reef. And uh, they don't seem to be doing much feeding. And uh, this is the main sort of behavior that we observe. And uh, this is what we call thermoregulation. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people are aware about uh, uh, South Ari and it's very busy uh, tourism activities in the area. So one thing we are trying to focus uh, this year and uh, to the coming years is uh, trying to uh, make people aware of the code of conduct to follow when you are swimming with the whale shark. So how do we avoid the negative impacts during encounters? So we have to follow the code of conduct. So I'll just briefly breeze through the code of conduct. And uh, there is recently a new resource that is going to be available very soon uh, for any, any guides who like to use it. We happily, you can happily get in touch with us and it will be available on our website. So it'll include a lot of a lot of information about the whale shark as well as a brief impact that you could use. So do not touch the whale shark. So they're not tactile species, obviously, I'm sure most of you know, uh, but we do have instances where people do touch them. And uh, a lot of the time, this is because of the lack of briefing and when before we get into the encounters. Um, keep a three to four meter distance. So whale sharks, they don't like when people are really too close to them, especially when there's a lot of people around. Uh, it needs that space when it's thermoregulating, otherwise it doesn't feel comfortable staying there. So keep about three meters from the body, four meters from the tail, and do not obstruct the whale shark. So whale sharks are usually, like I said, cruising, and when they're cruising, they don't like to be disturbed. So keep to the sides of the whale shark and it usually is pretty happy. And uh, they will, they could cruise for a long time, but if people do get in front of the whale shark, a lot of the time they will swim around or dive down immediately. And try not to swim on top of the whale shark as well. So don't stay, uh, especially when you're crossing over from one side to the other to take IDs or any other reason. Uh, because even though a whale shark is a little bit deeper, it could slowly come up right up to the surface. So always give it space from the top for it to come up to thermoregulate. Do not use any flash photography. So if you have cameras, always turn off the flash before you get into the water. And so this is because the whale sharks do not like uh, respond well to bright unexpected flashes of light. So keep your flashes off, flashes off and uh, it's fine if you have video lights, but just anything that is so sudden and bright. Another thing, uh, an interesting fact is that the whale sharks have the biggest eardrum of any animal. And uh, what you need to remember is that the amount of noise you make in the water can have a huge impact on the whale shark whether it's from the boats or just from yourself. So when, especially when you're getting into the water, try to enter the water from a seated position of the side of the boat and do not jump into the water. This creates a lot of noise, especially when there's a lot of people doing it at the same time. Try not to shout, splash excessively, keep your fins under the water. Um, like I said before, like, any kind of noise will disturb them. So try and be as quiet as possible in the water. 
this is just an example of a bad code of conduct. Uh, so this does happen a lot in South Ari. And uh, we just like to make a lot of people aware of how these things impact negatively on the whale shark. So over the recent years, uh, vessel activity along with tourism in the area has gone significantly. Uh, we have seen almost a double in numbers of vessels, uh, average vessels per day in the area. And uh, so with this, uh, more and more busy encounters do occur in Sampa area. The guidelines for whale shark encounters in the Maldives were put in place by EPA in 2009. And these guidelines were formed with the help of data collected by us and uh, knowledge shared. So it's still in place today as guidelines, but unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, it's not really regulated or uh, there's no sort of management plan at the moment. There are plans to regulate SAMPA, but obviously this has been delayed due to multiple reasons, including the pandemic. So we'll move on to some of the impacts the world sharks are facing uh, in the Maldives. Uh, so one of the biggest issue in uh, the Maldives is that the world sharks are facing a lot of vessel uh, collision injuries. So this could be amputations, lacerations, as an abrasions. So multiple injuries, different types of injuries. And some of these could be very minor, but uh, we recently noticed that uh, recent injuries have been pretty severe on the whale shark as well. So really deep cuts by propellers. So like I said before, the recent study of injury impact found that in comparing it to five years time, in just five years time from 2014 to 2019, the abundance of whale sharks has decreased in the on in the area. So from 48 whale sharks occupying the reef to 32 whale sharks occupying the reef. So uh, we can't say exactly this is due to increase in tourism and uh, the injuries, but it does have a really strong correlation to it. So like I said before, average injuries per sharks has increased one major injury per shark in 2006 to average three major injuries in 2019. And the percentage of sharks cited with major injuries steadily increasing each year from 2006 at 24% to from 2000, at 2019, it increased to 45%. So another thing is that the injured whale sharks spend more time in the area and uh, they then non-injured sharks. So this could be a reason that they are not able to dive deep due to these injuries they have sustained or they need more time thermoregulating in the surface. So uh, just like Baba Ganoush uh, story, whale sharks also have a really incredible healing rate. Uh, so results uh, suggest that uh, they do have uh, uh, the capacity to tolerate from these injuries. So they have really quick healing. All wounds reach up to about 90% surface area closure by day 35. And uh, the differences in healing was depending on the type of wound. So lacerations took a bit longer than abrasions where comparing it about, about 50 to 22 days. Just to close off, give a little insight into the 2020 report. Uh, so 2020 was, uh, we were only in field for three, uh, three months, uh, less than three months. And uh, most of our contribution came from uh, outside uh, contributors. So most of the submissions of well shots. So about 286 out of 75% came from um, contributors. 33 different contributors provide us data to us. And uh, one of the most encountered whale shark in the South Ari area was Shaiban with about 26 encounters. 43 new whale sharks were added to the register, eight females, seven males, and 28 unknown. So if everyone uh, 
could, if they do get a chance to take a picture underneath the world shark after you get the ID, that would be extremely helpful as we have recently got a lot of unknown uh, whale sharks in terms of sex identification. So another interesting uh, thing was that uh, there was two whale sharks that's been sighted in three different atolls. So uh, interesting movements. Uh, this is was in Pai Atoll and Bai Atoll in South Ori. And uh, another thing is that two whale sharks that has been sighted since 2017 was spotted this uh, 2020 as well, Nufile and Sky. And again, uh, no whale sharks of the Maldives has ever been recorded anywhere else in the world to date. So we're still waiting for a day where one of our older whale sharks to come up to uh, in another database around the world. So yeah, thank you guys very much for your time. If you have any questions, please pass it through. Thank you, Buzz, for all the data about the shark. So now we know a lot more about the biggest fish and how to swim with them. So in case one of us gets a chance to swim with the wonder, let's follow the code of conduct and then try to take the ID photos to submit for the research. Hopefully the well, shark research project will also get more data after the pandemic. So now we can ask for the Olive Ridley project. Emily, Claire, and Isha, are you ready? Yes, ready. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. My name is Emily Mundy. I'm working for the Olive Project as a sea turtle biologist and guest educator. Um, so what I will talk through is um, encountering sea turtles in the wild, um, because we would like to invite people to share also photo identification um, pictures with us for sea turtles. But of course, we also want to do this causing minimal stress to the animal as well. Um, Okay, there we go. Um, so if you are in an atoll such as North Male, Laviani or Lamu, you can share the pictures of sea turtles directly with one of us, the Oliverly biologist. Otherwise, you can email sea turtle ID at oliverlyproject.org and we can set you up as a contributor to our uh, photo ID project. So here's an example then of um, some sea turtle ID photos. Uh, so sea turtles were, are born with unique facial scales, um, which don't change throughout their lifetime. So photo identification therefore offers um, what is essentially a very cost-effective and non-invasive um, way to track individuals and populations as a whole. Um, so photos are very easy to take and um, anyone can actually contribute. So we also have lots of guest divers and snorkelers, other uh, diving instructors, um, sharing pictures with us for our study, which is fantastic. Um, so to get um, a new sea turtle ID, we need um, the right profile of the face, the left profile, and then if possible, the top of the head and the carapace as a whole as well. Um, our sea turtle IDs are anchored on the right profile. So if, um, if possible, it's good to focus on that side of the turtle, but of course, um, if appropriate in the time. Um, so I'll take you through our code of conduct for swimming with sea turtles, snorkeling and diving. So this is based on um, our current scientific understanding of their biology, their behavior, and the threats to them. And it's also in line with um, the Maldives Environmental Protection and Preservation Act, which has declared all sea turtles as protected species and states that disturbing or harming them is therefore prohibited. Um, the, seat, the conduct that we have also allows you to enjoy a richer, perhaps more memorable encounter with the sea turtle. Um, so I'm going to take you through uh, the signs of stress in sea turtles, because this is really what 
the code of conduct is trying to avoid. So the picture that you can see on my screen now shows a turtle that has been approached quite close by a snorkel or diver. Um, this turtle was found eating seagrass in a lagoon. Um, however, as you can see from the picture, the turtle has stopped eating. Um, so this already shows that its original activity has been disrupted. Um, so the turtle's raised its head up. It's actually opened its eyes wide and it's actively watching the person behind it with a side eye. Um, also, the body is raised up off the seagrass, so it's potentially ready to swim away. So this is a good idea that the turtle is aware of your presence and it might even be experiencing early stress. Um, the next level then would be high stress. So this would be a sea turtle that's actually swimming away from you, fleeing as it is afraid for its safety. But especially if a sea turtle actually turns its carapace towards you. So what this shows is that sea turtle is so worried about your presence or, or like the pursuit of it that it is starting to protect its body from, from attack. So the way that they use their, their shell is as a shield against an oncoming threat. So this is what we really want to avoid as we're snorkeling or diving with sea turtles. Um, so our code of conduct is as such. Um, so the first point there being keep your noise to a minimum because they are quite sensitive to noise. They're quite, they like to keep things nice and relaxed. Um, so splashing and talking should be down. Um, and then really the main point is not to disrupt the turtle's natural behavior. So we suggest approaching quite slowly from the side. Let the turtle see you from afar. Um, and then the turtle can come accustomed to your presence. And with you being on one side of the turtle, he can keep an eye on you um, and decide you know, whether your actions are trustworthy or not. But what's most important then is that the sea turtle actually has a clear path ahead of it. So it knows it can swim away if it so chooses. Um, and then of course, if a sea turtle does swim away, um, it might have already been swimming or it might be swimming away from your group. Um, just let them go. And if you follow a turtle and start to pursue it, they do start to get really stressed. So the fifth point here in the code of conduct is do not touch a sea turtle. So this is something I'll go in a little bit more into detail with. We're always um, repeating this point because a lot of people equate sea turtles with tortoises on land um, that, they, that they do touch, they're even kept as pets. But sea turtles are a totally different creature. Um, so we don't wanna touch them because we have bacteria and now we have um, maybe hand sanitizer, sun cream on our hands. So we can transfer these chemicals um, or bacteria onto the sea turtle's body, which can end up in their bloodstream and cause them ill health um, because their shell is porous. But at the same time, the shell actually has nerve endings throughout it and turtles can feel every, everything on the shell. Um, so they're also not, not tactile animals. They are not necessarily affectionate with each other and they don't seek um, to be petted. So they're not really like cats and dogs that want to be um, given affection from people. And it will actually cause them quite a lot of stress to be touched. Um, so always give the turtle a lot of space. That means don't swim above them, don't hover on top of them, um, and just or don't get too close to them. So we always advise this because we want them to feel relaxed, but also we don't want them to be too comfortable with humans in their personal space because this becoming accustomed to people might not keep them safe um, out there in the world where there are other threats to them. And then of course, we don't need to feed turtles there. Perfectly fine, find your own food and they might accidentally bite you. Um, so for divers, it's pretty similar. Don't approach a sea turtle closer than one and a half meters. Um, diving is inherently louder than snorkeling anyway, so they might uh, see you coming and, and flee a lot quicker. Um, but again, if it's very relaxed and you do get closer, always give it its own space. Um, and again, don't disrupt the turtle's activity. So it should feel safe enough to continue either sleeping or eating even though you are there. Um, and try not to surround them. They do prefer having people all on one side so that they can keep an eye on you. And also don't get in between them and the surface where they might need to breathe. And if a turtle is swimming past you, sometimes they do come quite close. So just stay very still. Don't block the path of the turtle. Don't be tempted to reach out and touch it. Just stay where you are nice and still and let the turtle control that interaction. So let the turtle control where it goes and the distance from you. Um, so because we're talking about photo ID, I'll just make a, a quick note on divers with cameras. 
Um, so they might not be taking ID photos or they might also be trying to take uh, the pictures, but always follow the code of conduct. Um, and what we want really is to, to remind people with cameras that you should always keep an eye on the turtle's reaction to you. So we can often get a little bit distracted because we're looking at the screen of the camera. So always keep an eye on how the turtle's reacting to your approach. Um, so again, if it's slowly from the side, uh, just keep an eye on the turtle's behavior. If it stops what it's doing, you might be a little bit too close. Um, don't use flash photography again, it's quite um, disruptive for them. And if a turtle is swimming away or starts to swim away, again, if you do pursue them, then they can start to get a little bit stressed. Okay, so here's a picture of um, a sea turtle that was resting and a group of divers is descending down towards it. So the turtles felt a little bit uneasy and is actually getting up to swim away. Um, so these kinds of things can be avoided just by watching the turtle. As soon as it starts to wake up, just backing off a little bit, maybe going around to one side. Um, this turtle is feeling a little bit uneasy because the diver is approaching him by diving down, or a snorkeler, sorry. Um, so sea turtles are also individuals. Sometimes they do get quite used to people. So some can be more shy than others, um, but always follow the code of conduct and always keep an eye on how the turtle's reacting to you. If they do start to show the early signs of stress or awareness, just back away a little bit and give them more space. And then if they do appear very, very relaxed, still try to give them their personal space bubble anyway. Um, so here's a very nice picture of two snorkelers staying at a nice distance to the side of one turtle and the turtle's carrying on eating in the lagoon. Um, and here's a nice picture of someone getting an ID picture for us. Um, so this uh, snorkeler has approached the turtle on his own, so the turtle's not surrounded by a group. He's also a nice distance away, um, and the turtle's pretty nice and relaxed and happy there. Um, so just think again, um, cameras these days, they, they create really high quality images. We have quite good zoom on the cameras now, and you can also edit the pictures afterwards. Uh, so we don't really need to get super close up to the turtles to get good ID pictures anyway. Um, so again, just to reiterate, um, we really encourage people to share pictures with us. Um, so you can contact one of um, the biologists directly or you can email us at seaturtleid at oliverdeeproject.org. Um, through the sea turtle identification and um, using the pictures, we also do a lovely adoption program, um, which is very popular with guests. It's a nice eco-friendly gift for someone. Um, because we'll also send you email updates when we see your turtle again. Um, so thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over now to Isha, um, who's going to go more into the um, the projects that we've done and the, the findings that we've had. Hi. So, um, can you all see the screen now? Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so I'll just briefly run over the results of the sea turtle population research, which from all of the data that we're collecting, we're trying to have the baseline data that helps us identify the sea turtle population in the Maldives right now. And we found out of all of the places surveyed that we've identified almost 4,000 Holtzville turtles and over a thousand green sea turtles. These are the two most common species of turtles in the Maldives. We do occasionally see other species as well, but these are the ones that usually live on our reefs. Um, so since the site and data has been collected, um, about 40% of the country has been surveyed. This data collection also depends on where most resorts are based as most of the photo IDs are submitted from marine biologists based at resorts. Though in recent years, we've had 
more and more citizen scientists contributing to the data as well. And this is kind of the population um, overview that we have. You can see we have a larger population of green sea turtles in Laviani and Lamu than the other atolls. Uh, but generally, we are mostly seeing hawksbill turtles around. And we also collect data on sea turtle nesting in the Maldives. There are some nesting hotspots that are well known in the country, but most of the spots are still not known, we believe. And from all of these turtles nests, we found most of them are green sea turtle nests. Very few are hawksbill nests. There's occasionally been olive ridley turtle nests and sometimes um, it's not, we've not been able to identify what species has nested there. Um, and based on the resorts on where we're at, we're also able to have a picture of what the nesting season in different at all looks like. This varies across different atolls as well. In Namu, we have um, noticed that there's significantly more, more nesting mid-year than at any other time, whereas in Laviani, you see that there's more nesting at the end and beginning of the year. So there are seasonal variations in nesting in different atolls. It's not the same across the country. And by contributing data of nests that you're seeing on the islands, you can help us identify the patterns and behaviors of nesting as well. And we have now started monitoring the turtle nests we get on islands with the permit from the Environmental Protection Agency by placing a night vision motion detection camera. And this helps alert us when there is movement from the nest and we are able to check on the nest right away. Um, this is only something we are able to carry out due to having a permit. And we also identify where the nests are based on just the kind of crawls that we see. Uh, sometimes turtles may come up on the beach and leave without laying a nest, and this is called a false crawl. Sometimes they come up, try to dig. Uh, they might get disturbed and they leave. And this you can also easily see just from observing the tracks. And then when it has laid a nest, you kind of can see that there's a lot of cover. The sand has been properly covered up and that helps us to then locate the nest. Of the two species that nest in the Maldives, they have very different kinds of um, crawls. The green sea turtles have a more streamline crawl up the beach whereas the hawksbills and all the ridley turtles kind of leave behind swirly zigzag patterns and so even if you didn't see which species was on the beach just by looking at the tracks you can identify what kind of nest you have on the island and in different islands you can also try and identify if there's been poaching just by looking to see if there's a large conical depression on the nest or footprints, and sometimes people who have poached the nest might leave behind egg fragments. And all of this helps us um, identify what are the threats that the turtles and turtle nests are facing because of us. And when we see turtles coming out, um, occasionally we would see them just kind of resting at the top the surface waiting for nightfall. They usually come out at night when there's this predators. At this stage, it's critical not to use white lights and not to have any kind of flash photography. Um, turtles are very sensitive to light and we want to keep it as dark as possible. Red lights are allowed. And it's also important not to interfere with this process because it's very important that turtles run down the beach on their own and this helps them imprint on the sand, which helps them return back to the same beach later. And when you're seeing a hatching event or when you're around the nesting or hatching turtle as well, it's important again to keep your distance, not to interfere with the process. And as much as possible, just 
help facilitate the way for turtles to go into the ocean. This doesn't always mean carrying it, but there would be times when you might have to help it if it's going to inland. The best thing would be to just try and keep places as dark as possible so that the turtle doesn't get confused. And if you have a nest on the island and you're worried about it hatching when you haven't been around it, you can look for the telltale signs of that depression in the sand and those tiny baby footprints and that lets you know that a turtle nest has hatched. Um, and the most important thing is that the turtles are able to make it into the ocean because while they hatch um, in a large group, only one in thousand hatchlings survive until adult troops. So it's very critical that we make sure turtles get into the ocean and go about their natural ways. And now Claire is going to talk a lot more about um, Rescue Center. Hello. It's not letting me start my camera, but can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Claire. Okay, I just no no camera, but that's fine. I can crack on. We haven't got much time, I realise. Um, so thank you very much for allowing us to share the um, Oliver Ridley project with you. And I'm going to talk to you quickly about the Marie Tuttle Rescue Centre that we here have here at Cocoa Palm. And um, this is a picture of our tank tanks here at um, Cocoa Palm Dooney Collie. We have one very large tank that's seven meters by five meters, um, and four medium-sized tanks and two smaller ones in the back. Now our tanks are all two meters deep, and that's very important for our re rehabilitation of our sea turtles. Um, that way, when they find when we find them buoyant, they actually can learn to dive again, um, and it helps really improve their chances and, and uh, speed at release. Uh, so far to date, since we opened in 2017 in February, we've had over 150 patients reach our rescue centre, and of those, 84 of them have actually been released. And we are currently have a very busy rescue centre where we have nine patients in Cocoa Palm, and we also have one patient at our rehabilitation centre at One and Only, which also consists of a very large tank that's seven metres by five metres and also two metres deep. So we have actually had four species that has visited our rescue centre. Um, the most common turtle that we've seen at the rescue centre is the Oliver Ridley species, and that's probably most, finally, uh, most commonly find them entangled in fishing nets. We've also had a green, uh, green sea turtles, hawksbill sea turtles, and we've also had one uh, loggerhead turtle that was a huge surprise to our rescue centre, and it was a very juvenile uh, bottom right photo there is little Emmy that we had. So we are very fortunate at Cocoa Palm to be able to have volunteers here at the Rescue Centre. We're now able to have up to three at a time and the volunteers are able to get involved with everything that we do at the Rescue Centre, whether it's giving medications, uh, caring for the turtle, the husbandry, the tank cleaning, uh, and they're a vital part of, of the role that we have here at the Centre. So we really encourage you, if you're interested in learning about sea turtles and visiting the Centre, um, check on our website for the details of becoming one of our volunteers. Um, and this is just another photo of the smaller tanks that we have here at the Rescue Centre. The other thing that we're really proud of at the Rescue Centre is our internship. We have Maldivian interns that can stay with us for up to three months. And at the clinic, we actually are able to do blood samples, fecal samples. We have many veterinary equipment that we're very proud of. So this photo shows our x-ray machine. We also have um, an ultrasound machine. We autoclave and therefore sterilize all of our medical equipment. And we also have a brand new endoscope that we're really excited to share with uh, all, all of you soon. We'll be posting about it shortly. Um, I'm hoping to help, that will help us um, basically see what's going on with these buoyant turtles and see whether we can actually fix them sooner. So I also thought I would share one clinical case with you that we've had at the Rescue Centre. This turtle was actually very important to us here at Cocoa Palm because it arrived on Cocoa Palm um, stranded in this little, little um, fishing net. So. The types of injuries that we see are obviously mostly due to the entanglement of the turtles in this plastic net. Uh, turtles are exceptionally strong and in their bid to try and escape these nets, they can do serious damage to their um, flippers, necks and, and body themselves, the, the, the shell. So this poor little turtle um, ended up having uh, the gross net affect both flippers left and right front. Um, and it had cut through the skin, through the muscle, right down to the bone. So you can actually see the bone there, which is the humerus 
um, on the left flipper on, in that right photo. So we obviously went to look after this turtle. So we did a few full assessment and we took x-rays of this turtle. And here you can see the damage that has been done to both those bones, uh, both left and right by the fishing net. So this is an example of um, obviously quite a severe injury and we were really, really concerned that we might have to amputate um, one of these flippers, if not both, because the bone was so severely damaged. Um, but at the centre, we have this, like I mentioned, this brilliant clinic and um, we've had many vets over the years. This is actually Dr. Claire Lomas um, and we perform, perform surgery on this turtle together. Um, and luck luckily for this turtle, um, it actually managed to fix both these flippers. And then within a few months, we were actually able to release it. Um, so this is it just recovering in the tanks. And then here it is a few months later um, being released by one of our interns, Tonti. Um, back into the sea. So the whistle stopped tall. And off we go. So this is obviously the best part about the rehabilitation process for our turtles. Um, quickly, I just wanted to mention that we also have a really um, fascinating and wonderful um, setup where we have a visiting vet program. So vets from around the world that specialize in sea turtles or exotics medicine can actually visit the center too and impart their knowledge to the rescue center. So the whole ethos of our veterinary center and uh, vets that we hire is to improve the, the standards of care that we give to our patients here at the rescue center. And we're ever improving and ever expanding. So that's why we're really keen to always get the best equipment that we possibly can and treat our turtles to the highest uh, we possibly can at the Oliver Ridley project. So that's just a really quick tour from the Marine Turtle Rescue Center. Um, and that's it from me. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire, Isha, and Emily. We now know a little bit more about the turtles and how to swim with the turtles. And turns out none of these marine animals like the flash photography. And then we learned about turtle nestings and hatchings. Now we can ask Hannah from MMRI to present their data. Hannah, uh, thanks, you ready? Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Jan. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. Uh, uh, if you're able to see my screen now. Yeah, we can see the presentation. All right, awesome. Uh, evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Hannah, and I work as a marine biologist at the Maldives Marine Research Institute. And I'd like to talk to you about the coral reef and coral database and the National Coral Reef Monitoring Framework. Uh, before going into that, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about the institute. Um, so we are a research institute of the government, and we mainly focus on three things, um, ecosystem research, so doing coral reef research, shark research, um, ETP research, stuff like, stuff like that. Then we do fisheries research um, on reef fisheries, pelagic fisheries, group of fisheries, so the all types of fisheries that goes on in the Maldives. Um, and the last type of research we do is on mariculture research to develop that uh, capacity within the Maldives and the techniques and all these things. So we focus on a couple of different things which are all geared towards um, learning more about all of it so that we can build up the management plans and so on and so forth. Um, so I'd like to start us off with um, three key um, publications that are coming, uh, two key publications that are coming out this year uh, from us uh, that really highlights um, our need to build up uh, the citizen science uh, component as well as contribution and encourage contributions to the coral database. So the first uh, key research that we'll be re releasing later this year is the marine resource review. So this review is something we do um, on a semi-regular basis, uh, where we present the current health and status of key fishery resources, as well as the coral reefs. Um, so this um, review 
accumulates the most recent knowledge we have, the most recent information we have, either from published materials or internal documents or reports we've received from various people to present the status outlook of um, our key fishery resources and the coral reefs. Um, we identify what data there is out there and identify what our information gaps are. Um, all of this is used to propose management recommendations to the ministry so that we can uh, build up those capacity and get those in place. And additionally, it guides fisheries and reef monitoring efforts. One of the key things we are seeing as we do this review is that we need to be able to tap into the citizen science uh, network a bit more uh, to fill a lot of the information gaps we have. Um, one of the challenges we have in our monitoring efforts is reaching out to various uh, locations within the Maldives because it's, I'm, I'm, as highlighted by the others who presented before me, it's impossible for everyone to be everywhere at once. So we have to build up a network. And this is also a, a fairly apparent during the development of the next report as well, which is the Coral Reef Trend Report, uh, being written by one of my colleagues. Um, this report identifies and write, uh, reports the trends of coral reefs from 1998 to 2021. Uh, 20, but we've had to limit um, where we pull the trend from to our long-term monitoring sites established as the National Coral Reef Monitoring Sites and the Maldives Environmental Management Protection Sites. So it's pulling information uh, from quite a number of limited sites compared to the entirety, relative to the entirety of the Maldives. Um, so from these sites, we are seeing um, the decline in coral cover from 1998 being very low slowly recovering as we go towards the 2004, reaching a sort of peak there, and again declining uh, as we go towards the or, um, 2010s due to various smaller bleaching events. We saw that the reefs had recovered in 2016, reaching about 20-25%, which was really, really great, but it did highlight something for us, that it took about 10 years to start to reach uh, the coral cover, um, the coral cover we were seeing before the 1998 bleaching event. But unfortunately, as quite a lot of you would know, um, we were hit by a pretty big bleaching event again in 2016. Um, and we see this decline again, um, moving forward to this year. Um, it's not quite as bad as the 1990 event, but it's still an additional stress we saw. Um, it's an additional stress on our coral reefs. But um, it's important to us to know that these are these these trends are pulled from our limited monitoring sites. And to be representative of the country truly, we need to have better spatial coverage. And one thing for us again. Uh, and I'm saying this quite a lot already, is develop the citizen science network further. Similar thing with uh, the next graph I'll show you. One thing we do at MMRA with related to coral reefs is try to identify coral spawning trends. Where, when does it, when do coral spawn? Where does it, where do they spawn? And this has been quite a difficult thing for us to track because reports are fairly intermittent. And these past two years, it's been really challenging because people have been, haven't been able to go into the water. Um, it's been quite a challenge to just go and see what the corals are like, whether they're spawning during the correct times. But these, these, the graphs I'm presenting here are developed from the reports we have gotten over the years. Um, so we see coral spawning quite often aggregated in the March, April months. Um, we've got rep reports from Lama et al. Um, we've got reports from Ari et al. Um, we've got uh, reports from North Mali et al, as well as Wav et al. But these are quite spotty and it would be great to be able to build 
of this network um, and see where corals are spawning. Is, is there any spatial differences um, from north to south in the Maldives? We don't quite know yet. We've got um, inferences, but we don't know to say for sure quite yet. So this takes us to the coral database. Um, we know, we've known that this is a challenge, reaching this spatial um, coverage within the Maldives, getting the information we need. And the coral database was developed with that in mind. So the database supports the National Coral Reef Monitoring Framework, um, which develops protocols um, to monitor our coral reefs. It's hosted by MMRI, but it collates all sorts of marine related information, um, coral reef information, coral information, reef fish information, um, invertebrate information, seagrass information, all sorts of marine related information. And it's a multi-sectoral database, meaning that it's not just um, NGOs uh, or private citizens or governed organizations um, that are engaged within the, within the database, it's um, engaging um, everyone so that they can contribute data to a single database, but also get something in return. So the idea behind the coral database is that if you present or offer data into the database, you get a short report or a trend or a averages of what you have submitted to the database. So as part of the database, we've developed some national protocols for coral reef surveys. Um, these were published around 2018, and there are a couple of protocols. Three I'd like to highlight are the point intercept protocols, mobile fauna protocols for invertebrates, as well as fishes. So these create a standardized protocol to survey coral reefs using transects so that we generate standardized data across the Maldives, which is then comparable to each other. So using this method, we can very easily compare what's happening in Harley Fettel to what's happening in Raritol, to what's happening within Half Fettel, to Addu Atoll, so on and so forth. Um, and it's very much geared towards the survey uh, skill level. So if you are just starting out and you know what a coral is, you can record life forms as corals, but if you're a bit more confident in your coral ID, you could record it as genera or as species. It's really up to the uh, skill level of the survey and what they are comfortable with. An, an additional thing I'd like to highlight are reporting forms we've got as well, including the bleaching report forms and the coral spawning report forms. Um, moving on. Um, this is a new protocol we've just developed um, targeting two sort of people in the water. So the first protocol is a transect photo quadrat protocol. And these are geared towards uh, surveyors um, who do transect transects within their reefs um, and so on and so forth. So they have the user transect lay out the measuring tape um, as per usual, and there's start and end marker. And you take images every interval uh, within a certain number of transects. Um, so for this protocol, it's 20 images per transect, 80 images per depth. And it's very much geared towards marine biologists, NGOs, students, researchers who would repeatedly survey one area. But we've also developed a second protocol that's called the random protocol. Um, and this is geared towards people who do fun dives, um, who will go out snorkeling with a camera and might just be interested or have the time and willingness to gather some data for us. Um, so this, the random protocol does not involve any sort of transits. All you need is an underwater camera. And all we need is those photos and the location information. So what you would do is if you've got a dive computer with you, you take a photo of your dive computer and then 20, take 20 images from that, that depth. Um, so this can be carried out with by divers or snorkelers who are all willing and have the time during their dives to take some images. Ideally, it would be great for us if you take images from multiple depths, but that's really up to you. We've just given you a protocol that you can use, um, take some quick images for us that would help us with our research. So once you've got these protocols, um, you can 
compress them into a single folder with um, the date, location, depth, and your name, and you'll be able to submit the Coral database or to MMRI. So where is the Coral database? So unfortunately, the Coral database, the actual Coral database is currently um, down for maintenance, but we've made, uh, we've made a temporary site so that you guys can go and access the protocols and submit the data as well. So this is a temporary uh, site, which I'll do, try and do a quick demonstration now. So this is a temporary site for us. So I put up the, put up the link in the presentation as well, um, which I'm happy to share um, later on. But at this site, you'll be able to access the protocols as well as access the data submission forms. So if you go to the protocols link, you'll be able to click on whatever protocol you're interested in. So if you're interested in the random protocol, um, it takes you to the it takes you to a PDF file, which is taking a little while to load, but it will take you to a PDF file that um, gives you all the information you would need to run that protocol. Um, so yeah, just like that. So it tells you your objectives, what you might want to take with you, um, and essentially it's a quick instruction guide to do the protocol. So once you've got your images, your data taken up, you can then go back to the data submission tab and you'll be able to submit the data to the correct um, submission tab. So if it's a random protocol, it'll guide you to a Google form um, where you fill it in quickly um, to submit the necessary information and the zip folder I mentioned, if it's the case of the uh, uh, the protocols or an Excel file, if it's the pit, uh, pit data or the fish data. We've also listed in the data submission, the coral spawning report submissions and the bleaching report submissions. So they're all collated in one place, very easy for you guys to see. Um, and if you need to contact us as well, we've included um, contact details within the website. So, um, that was a very quick run through of um, the NCRMF, MMRI, as well as the Coral database. Um, so you can see updates of our various works, uh, the database and all sorts of uh, information uh, during at these handles at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hannah. We now know a little bit about the coral research that's been done in the MMRI. So hopefully people will be more willing to send the spawning and coral bleaching reports. And then maybe we might be lucky enough to see the coral spawning slick that we could report to them later on. We still have some questions coming from the audience. So let's answer some questions for a while. Maybe we can take 15 minutes and then we can answer the questions live. Should we start from the Monte Trust? Yes. Uh, hello. Hey. Hello. Just, do you have any questions that you would like to answer here, or is all the questions already answered in the question and answers box? Uh, we have actually answered all the questions in the question and answer box. But um, if anyone has a question now that we have the floor open, then any of the projects can um, answer them. So just type them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them live at this time. So if you have any more, I think there's one question right now for Hannah. So maybe Hannah wants to answer it live. Uh, sure, um, I was typing in an answer, but. I can answer it live as well. 
Um, so in terms of beach erosion, we have not been able to directly connect um, smothering of corals to beach erosion, but we do know that sedimentation from various uh, sources can smother these corals. Um, we can't, we've not collected enough data to prove that breach erosion that's occurring is due to sea level rise. There's multiple things to consider there from changes to currents, um, uh, changes to sea level rise, uh, all of these things. So no, um, we can't connect it to one single thing quite yet. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, there's a few questions coming up now. So, Yanni, do you want to take over and ask the questions to each of the, um, the presenters? Just bear in mind that uh, no one can see the question. So if you uh, read out the whole question, Yanni, and then the uh, project can answer. So we have a question for MMRP and the Maldives Wealth Shark Research Project asking if there are any volunteering programs available and how to join. Cool, uh, I'll answer quickly on behalf of MMRP and then we'll let the Whale Shark Program take over. So yeah, we have volunteering programs. Um, usually it's during the Southwest Monsoon in partnership with our team in Bar Atoll. So you have the chance of joining for around three months internship and then there will be two interns at a time, so two positions available. And then once those three months are over, there will be another two participants able to join for the following three months. So it's kind of a six month um, place for four different people, but we advertise as and when we're gonna be hiring. So you should pay uh, keep note of our social media and check our website around, I think April, correct me if I'm wrong, Yanni, you're there. April time, I think is when the... Uh, it starts at June and July when the Manta season starts in Bath. Okay. And it lasts for like three months. And then after the three months, we take other two interns for the next three months. So it's the stage from June to the end of November. Okay, perfect. So basically keep an eye out on our website or our social media and we'll share um, when you are able to, to apply. And then um, well, Maldives Whale Shark Research Program, would you like to answer? Hi, hello. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll get back with the question regarding the volunteer program. So currently uh, the program isn't fully operational yet. So we are just doing a couple of two-week research expeditions this year in Salvari. We have an expedition in October for two weeks, another one in November, and then in December, but no expedition in September, for example. And I've just sent the email address. I've shared it in the chat. And then I've also seen the question from Hardik, what do you estimate the total population of whale sharks in the Maldives to be? We currently have 547 individuals registered in our database. Okay. If you have any other questions, just let us know. Does anybody have any other questions? No, I, I hear you guys. Oh, Steve, I think you have a video on your microphone. There is a question um, for the Maldives Whale Shark Program again. And what do you estimate is the total population of whale sharks in the Maldives? Yes, so, so we have uh, currently 547 uh, registered in individuals in the database for the Maldives. Thank you, Clara. So if anyone has any other questions, uh, please type them in now. I will stay on for a few more minutes. If not, thank you for participating. And we will actually be sending out a um, summary of each of the 
the projects and what we've uh, all the links and email addresses that we've mentioned throughout each of the presentations on how you can contribute data. So um, keep an eye out for that. We've also recorded the webinar, so you'll be able to uh, get the link to watch it back again in the future. So thank you also for taking your time out of your evening to join us tonight. Also, if anybody have any more questions, you can always email to us or you can ask questions via our social media. As just pointed out on the presentation, we have Facebook and Instagram for the MMRP, and then we have Twitter for the Monte Trust. So if any one of you like to ask any questions or find a link to anybody, always feel free to text us on the Instagram or Facebook. It seems like there are no more questions, but we'll stay for two more minutes and see if there are more. If not, we can end the webinar. Thank you there so much. There was one much. more question, which I think I lost it in the Q&A section, but it was asking about if we had seen any changes in the sex ratio of turtles due to climate change. And currently with the baseline research that we're doing, we're not able to assess the sex ratio of the nests that we have on the islands. Um, it's also difficult because it's impossible to sex turtles by eye when they're younger. Um, but we do we have noticed that in the past few years we are getting in Lamo, um, the nests are coming in earlier than usual. And in Lavini also there's been more nests out of season than usual. So um, we don't fully understand the impacts that climate change is having on less yet, but there are differences. And by collecting baseline data, hopefully we'll be able to come up with more solid answers. And I think Claire wanted to talk more about um, rescue center volunteering. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, the camera works now. Hello, everyone. Um, I just had a lot of questions about the volunteer opportunity. Um, so here at um, Coco Palm, we have them all year round. Um, you can stay between two weeks and a month. Um, and we have a lot of questions from vet students. So the veterinary students can come to the rescue center just as like a volunteer, but obviously we do focus then um, more on the medical side for the students. And that's the same for veterinary nurses or nurses themselves and vets too. So if you're interested in spending some time with us looking at turtles and learning how, what sort of medications and procedures that we do here, then just take a look on our website as well. Um, and the visiting vet opportunity is for vets that are five years out of um, vet school that are focusing on exotics and wildlife specifically and obviously any sea turtle veterinarians out there are more than welcome to come and join us too so uh, that was just sort of answering most of the questions about the volunteering here on the island so thanks for that and thanks very much for a really wonderful uh, webinar thanks for trust thank you Claire so I hope that whoever is interested in volunteering with the Olive Ridley project, they know what to do. Hopefully they will contact Claire soon and they get to work with the turtles. So does anybody have any more questions? I think that might be it. So if any of the projects would like it to say any last few words, then please feel free to turn on your cameras and say something. But thank you all for your presentations tonight. Thank you, Yanni, for hosting. And thank you, everyone who's still in the call for watching us this evening and spending a few hours learning about our work. We're all really passionate about what we do. So we hope that you are too, and we hope that we've inspired you to help with data collection and maybe um, be able to come and volunteer with us one day. 
So I'm going to turn my camera off now. Thank you, everyone. And good night. Have a good evening. And I'll hand over to the other projects to say a last few words. So yeah, we can go with the order. Is there anybody from Welsh Shark Research that would like to say something? Maybe Buzz? Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, thank you, everyone, all the other uh, organizations as well for the informative sessions. And I hope we will get lots of new contributors and uh, people also understanding a lot about how to interact with these animals. Thank you, Bas. And for the Olive Ridley project, do you have any last words before we leave? <laughs> no one's going to answer. Um, yeah, just a huge thank you again for organising this. It's been wonderful to show um, the work that we do, and obviously from Mesh Centre. I'm going to pass over to Emily and then Isha as well to say thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us to join in. It was really nice to get an update for all the other projects. Um, we're also very happy to share our Manta pictures, well shot pictures. So um, yeah, looking forward to having lots of turtle pictures rolling in. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily. And Isha, would you like to say something? I will just thank you for having us and um, yeah, I look forward to more turtle photos and hopefully I look forward to seeing whale sharks and more mantas and corals as well. So I can send the shots. Yeah. yeah, we can contribute to each other's work and then everyone can contribute to our work. It's the best way to run this. And Hannah, would you like to say any last words? Uh, just to thank everyone, um, especially to um, Jeff and Jan for organizing this and to the others for presenting. It was really interesting to hear everyone's research and the different ways we could be contributing. So like, I think I echo everyone else when we, and I say, um, really hoping we'll be able to uh, get some info coming in. Thank you. Thank you all for joining and thank you all three researchers of the research programs for telling us about your data, your research, and how to contribute. So hopefully we'll get more data through the atolls that we have limited access to, like from the up north around Ha'ali Fadal or deep south around Formula. And hopefully we'll be able to go out and find more mantas, whale sharks, and turtles, and the nice corals. Thank you all so much for joining, and we'll be ending the webinar. Hopefully see you soon.